you know, Joe got up here and said, I have one announcement. And I said, hey, wait a minute. Oh, wait. I didn't mean about my announcement. Sorry, Joe. Um, I do want to start reminding people, and I know you're going to say, why now? But in October, the third weekend of October, we will host our annual picnic. And uh, we were looking at this, and I was talking with Velma, and this is actually the 10th year we've done the picnic. And so I think we really need to start marking calendars for October 19th. And the reason I say that is, you know, a 10-year anniversary, that, that should be awesome. Like to have as many years to be there, but I also would like for you to start thinking about who you can invite. It could be friends, family, former members, whether they moved off or wherever. Love to see who we can get at the picnic. I think we need to have the heads up three four months out. That way we can make sure we have it on our calendars. You can make sure to clear out a space. I do promise we will have a barbecue. Amen. I'm not sure of what type, <laughs> but uh, I know of a, a person who knows how to do barbecue, and uh, we will have a barbecue. With that being said, I also want to remind us that in December there's a giveaway, but before we ever have that giveaway, there's a whole lot of work that goes into the December giveaway. It really kind of goes on all year long. But for the past several years, we've had the opportunity to bring in a massive load of decent clothing that needs to be sorted and gone through. And it comes from the Greenwood Fire Department here in uh, Winchester. They do a big rubber cell, and they have been so gracious to donate any of the clothing and some of the housewares to us after the rubber cell was over with. And I don't know if you were here last year. Uh, Jim and Joe and some others helped us load up. Uh, it was not just a little load of clothing, was it? You know, we used two different trailers and there was a lot of stuff. Well, that is August the 10th this year. And we'll start sorting August the 11th through the 24th. And Heather really does want some help doing that. I, mean, I know that Heather and June and Daryl spent hours and hours and hours, actually spent days sort of in the clothing and everything else. Again, why so early? It's the only way that we pull the giveaway off is we start early. It's how we get everything done. It's how we have all the clothing ready to go. So if you can start looking at your calendars, and Mark, August 10th, and then the 11th through the 24th, I don't, I don't care if you just come that morning to the 10th and help load a trailer or unload the trailer, or you can come a part of the 11th or the 12th, or you know, the church is 11th, we'll have more church for the 11th, but any part of those days, it doesn't mean we don't need to the entire day, that'd be great. It's just any part of one day is up to help us well. Just for your information, a few upcoming events to be looking forward to. This morning, in this lesson, we are going to be looking at the final, yes, I said the final of this series in the Son of God. We're going to be looking at the idea that Jesus is the light of the world. And yes, I've preached on this topic several times. But one of the things I saw in this topic as I started going to, into it is, well, we always talk about him being just the light and, and what the light is. And there is so much more in the Gospel of John and in this section of the Gospel of John that is exceptionally important. You know, you've got to think about this idea that when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, <laughs> But the response is from many of the, the religious elite of the day. We've got to start to understand that their response to him was uh, not the belts. Matter of fact, they scoffed at it. How are we to believe your testimony? You can't testify about yourself, is what they'll say. Of course, Jesus' response, and that is, why can't I? My testimony is true. 
It's accurate. But also you and you have said even in your law that the testimony of two witnesses of at least two is held as true. And I have the testimony also of my father. And I think that is something that is key to knowing that Jesus is who he says he is. This testimony of the father, and you're going, but where is it? It's interesting because as you start looking at the ministry of Christ, his ministry is bookmarked with the testimony of the Father. Remember, as Jesus is baptized, there, uh, John the Baptist baptizes him, and the, the image of the dove, you know, the light of his head, and he all of a sudden hear of God saying, This is my son. Listen to him. And then you have the, the account of the Mount of Transfiguration. Right? And God again at the, his, at the end of his span in the hair of Jesus stayed here on earth says, This is my son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. All of this helps us to know what it means to be the light of the world. So let us start in this morning on this journey of John. Let us start on the eighth chapter of the book of John in this journey that Jesus is the light of the world. In John chapter 8, there in verse 12 through 20, we read this. This is then Jesus again to, spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You're testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I've come from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I've come from, nor where, where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone in it. But I and the Father who sent me, even in your laws it has been written, that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself. And the Father who sent me testifies about me. So they were saying to him, well then where is your Father? And Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one sees him because his hour had not yet come. In understanding this idea that, that Jesus is the light of the world, that Jesus is light, we need to stop and think about what he has actually said here. You know, we, we look at the ministry of Christ. Oftentimes we look at Christ and think, well, well, he was the meekest man that ever lived. And, and yet, we need to understand that he comes across here in this section pretty sternly with those Pharisees. As they start to you, well, your testimony is nothing but a lie. No, it's true. Let me tell you why it's true. Because you got the testimony not only of me, but you have the testimony of my father. Well, who's your father? Where's your father at? If you knew my father. Now he's talking to, remember, some religious people, people who know the Mosaic law. They know they know God, right? Matter of fact, uh, in, in the Jewish culture, God is held so highly that they will not even put the vowels in the name of Yahweh. Because they look at God so highly. He says, you are to know God and you don't even know who God is. And how then if you don't know God, will you know me? He's not being easy with them right here. He's basically saying, if you who 
professed to be godly knew God, you would know who I am. And this morning, what I want us to understand is when we look at Jesus as the light of the world, we should know who he is by what God said and what we see through the word. So let us start into this lesson in looking at Jesus is the light. There in John chapter 1 and verse 1 and following, John writes this in the very beginning of the gospel. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, not anything made was made, or made that was made. He in, or in him was life, and that life was light of men. The light shines in darkness, and yet the darkness has not overcome it. The light of the light of the world. Earlier on in the very beginning of the gospel, he says, in the beginning was, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that Word is the light that provides life. But what is that light that he's talking about? What is that light that he's talking about? Luke, of course, in his gospel, we have this in chapter 2, verse 29 through 32. He records this about Simeon. Y'all remember who Simeon is? Simeon is this old man who had been promised by God that he would not pass away until he had got the light in his eyes upon the Messiah. And Luke records this about Simeon. In chapter 2, verse 29 through 32. There we go. He says, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you prepared in the fruit in the presence of all peoples. A light of revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people in the Israel. Lord, now my eyes have seen your salvation. Who is this Jesus? He says, I am the light. Simeon says, that light is my salvation. It is your salvation. Matter of fact, Simeon even goes on to say, he's the salvation to us all. He's a salvation to the Gentiles, Simeon said. But not only the salvation to the Gentiles, it's the glory of the people of Israel. Simeon, that this prophet of old, about the prophets, this man of God, who lived there in the temple, day in and day out, waiting for the promised Messiah of God, makes his eyes upon the Messiah, that is Jesus the Christ. He said, this is the one. This is the light. And in his reference, that light was salvation that was going to come. Of course, we also can go over to 2 Timothy. Chapter 2. Or chapter 1, sorry, the conversion. It says, In which now has been manifested through the appearing of the Savior Jesus Christ, who have abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Simeon says, He's our salvation. And Paul says to Timothy, He brought us light by abolishing death. Jesus is the Lord. That light gives life. It gives life because it is a lost shell. It's got to bring death. This is what the religious people, the, the Jews there, were having such a hard time with. They were having such a hard time because this wasn't fitting in with their idea of who the Messiah was. 
They were having such a hard time simply because they were to have known the law, and yet they really didn't know it. And even though the Messiah, that is Jesus Christ, fulfilled all the prophecies and fulfilled the scripture, they didn't fully get it. <coughs> they didn't get it because they didn't know God, even though they were supposed to have known God. But because they didn't know God, they didn't see the light. Something for each and every one of us to think about, isn't it? We're talking about Jesus, the Son of God, this whole last few weeks. So the bigger question is, do we know God? Because when we start to know God, we know Christ. And vice versa. When we fully know Christ, then we know who the Father is. For Jesus is the light of the world. We see this in that same section and understand that Jesus is the light, that his testimony, what Jesus says, is true. While we re read Matthew's account of the gospel in chapter 5 and verse 16, it says, in the same way, let your light shine. And this is Jesus talking to his disciples, to those who are listening. He says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now Jesus is reminding his followers this. You, when you're living, right? And this is all the, the what we call the Sermon on the Mount is when you live, you, you live your life in such a way that people see that life that is within you. They see that light of God burning in you. You live and you act in a godly manner always, being truthful and honest to all of those who are around you, loving others, taking care of others. And people will see that and they will know and understand who the Father is. And so when Jesus in the book of John says, I'm testifying about myself. You stop and you've got to understand that he said, look, here's what I've done. Here are the signs that I've performed. Here's what I've done. I've been doing nothing but the work of God the entire time. Now I'm having to expand this out for everybody here. But that's literally what's being said. What I'm saying is true. I'm not saying anything in other words what Jesus is saying that goes against the word of God and goes against the Mosaic law. I'm not saying a single thing that goes against it. Is what he's getting at from them. Everything I've done so far has fulfilled the word of God. Has fulfilled the Mosaic law. What I say is true. And this was what was so hard for the religious elite of the day. For you see, they should have known, obviously, that it was true. But yet it was hard for them to take it. And it wasn't hard because they didn't want to admit it was true, but it was hard because the multitudes were starting to get it. Hordes of people were listening to the Messiah and were getting it. But yet there is Jesus in the treasury of the temple. <coughs> and he said, they're getting it, but you don't get it. You who are supposed to be the teachers of the people, you're missing it. It kind of makes me wonder, is this part of the reason in James, in the third chapter of James, he says, not, let not many of you become teachers. Not because you can't teach. Let not many of you become teachers because you don't fully get it. You see, that's part of the problem that was going on. Is that you had a lot of people who were saying, hey, yeah, I'm a religious teacher. But they didn't truly know God. And because they did not know God, they did not know Christ, nor did they see the prophecy being fulfilled. But let's go on to finish this up and to, to see it a little more clearly. 
For Mark in the gospel there in chapter 14, <coughs> verse 49, he says, Every day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not see me or seize me. But this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures. And again, in Luke, in chapter 24, and verse 44, he goes on to say, he says, Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Jesus talking to his disciples. All these things must be fulfilled. What I said is true. How do we know it's true? Because we can go back and we can look to see, oh yeah, what he said fit exactly with God's word. What the prophets of old have said. What the psalmist had said. But more than that, an understanding that Jesus is the light of the world and that his testimony is true, we need to understand that his testimony is that of our end. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, we read this. And behold, a voice out of the heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That was before any of this ever began. At the very beginning of the ministry of Christ, God says, this is my son. This Jesus you're listening to and watching, this is my son. In whom I am well pleased. <coughs> I don't know if a higher testimony one can have than that. For God to literally say, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Matter of fact, as I started looking at this, this really started kind of making my brain kind of turn in a way it had never turned before. And here's why. We talk about powerful statements in the Gospels and powerful statements in the Bible. But whether you realize it or not, this is one of the most powerful statements there is. And here's why. God is openly out loud, saying, listen to my son. This is Jesus. This is the Messiah. This is the one I told you about. And this is the end of time. Toward the end of his ministry there, we receive, we read it in Luke chapter 9, verse 28 through 36. He says, some eight days after these sayings, he took along Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, there appeared, there was an appearance of the faith uh, on his face that became different. And his clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, two men talking with him, they were Moses and Elijah, whom appearing in glory were speaking of his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep. But when they were fully awake, they saw him in glory and the two men standing with him. And as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Not realizing what he was saying, and while he was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. Then a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and reported to no one in those days any of the things which they had seen. So this is one of the most important sections you'll ever read. This is my son. Listen to him. What was the claim of the Pharisees? Where's your father? We don't see him. We didn't hurt him. And Jesus again. 
is testified about openly, out loud. This is my son. says, I don't know why in the world. How do we know it, Jesus? We can't trust you. Yes, you can trust my testimony. <coughs> my testimony's been true. How do we know it's true? Well, you can go back and look at it. My testimony's true also because my father agrees. He testifies to me. Oh yeah, where's your father? Just go back and look. thing is, you don't know me because you don't know my father. I don't know if there's any harsher, harder statement than have ever been made. But often I wonder if that is the statement that should be made to so many of us. You don't know Jesus because you don't know God. And if you knew God, you would know Jesus. And if you know Jesus, you would know God. Here's my question for you. Do you know who God is? Do you understand who Jesus is, that he is that Messiah? If so, what stops you from putting him on? What stops you from taking on that life that he gives? Why are you so afraid of death? Are you ready to confess Christ before him? Do you believe that he is the only God, the Son of God? Are you ready to walk in a new life? A life no longer as the world sees it, but a life that's God. Ready to be a change, person to change. Be buried with God. Be buried with Christ. To have your sins washed away. It's not going to happen today. You need prayer to the church.